Well, we may as well get started here. Okay. Um, well, thanks for coming, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dave Umhafer, journalism faculty member and director of the O'Brien Fellowship in Public Service Journalism here in the Diedrich College of Communication. On behalf of Sarah Feldner, Dean of the college, I want to welcome you to the 2020 Burley Media Ethics Lecture. The lecture exists because of the generation of Marquette Journalism alum, William Burley, who in his distinguished career went on to found a not small company called the E.W. Scripps Company. Bill, we thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as advertised today, we are joined by Scott Hyam and Sari Horwitz, two key members of the Washington Post team that reported the opioid files. Uh, the series was a Pulitzer finalist for public service, and we are proud to say that their work was awarded the Marquette O'Brien Fellowship Award for High Impact Journalism. Congratulations again on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good. Uh, this is actually just the latest collaboration by this dynamic duo. Uh, they've teamed up for years on major investigations at the Post, both local stories and national, it should be noted. Uh, together and apart, they have earned dozens of journalism awards. So we asked them today to talk about why they chose this story about the opioid crisis, what they found, and what challenges they faced along the way. And uh, just a, a quick presentation note, after they speak, uh, we're going to have a long Q&A session moderated by two Marquette student journalists, Natalie St. Ange and Christopher Miller. Uh, but for now, I'm going to kick it to Sari and Scott and take it take it away. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. We, we're, we're really honored by this award. And, and, uh, and so thank you very much. It, mean, it means a lot to us. And it, it also... Uh, you know, puts more focus and attention on, on a very important issue. Um, and, and we wish that we could be there with you all. Uh, um, and we we're writing a book together now, and maybe after our book comes out, you'll, you'll, you'll have us come out there and we can meet with all of you and, and hang out. We would really, we really love that. Um, you know, sometimes uh, you pick a story and sometimes a story picks you. Um, and, and that's what happened in, in, with this story. It kind of picked us. Uh, there, there, there was an uptick in, in, in overdose deaths around the country. Um, and there was a reporter on the local desk, on the, on the uh, health desk at the Washington Post named Lenny Bernstein. And he was asked to take a look at why there were so many overdose deaths. So basically, you know, middle-aged women in America. And, it, and they had the highest mortality rate of any other demographic in the United States. And so he started looking into this and he started to realize that the thing that was driving their deaths was uh, overdoses from prescription drugs, from opioids, from, from Oxycontin, Oxycodone, uh, Percocet, uh, Percodan, all those kinds of pills. And, and so he came back to his editors and said, you know, this is the cause. And they said, well, where are all the pills coming from? And so he embarked again on a quest to find out where the pills were coming from. And he started looking at court cases and he started to see that there were a number of big giant drug companies in the country who had been fined for basically allowing pills to be diverted to the black market. Um, and these are companies that, uh, that, that he had never heard of, that we had never heard of, they're, but they're massive, massive uh, uh, corporations. And so he started digging into that. And then uh, along the way, uh, somebody told him that he needed to talk to somebody at the DEA, a guy named Joe Ranazizi. And uh, Joe used to run the division of the DEA that oversees pharmaceutical drugs, uh, not cocaine or marijuana and all the and heroin, but pharmaceutical drugs. And so it, it's considered to be not a very glamorous uh, post at the DEA, you're not dealing with big drug cartels and, you know, big drug gangs in the United States, you know, you're basically trying to prevent pharmacies and drug distributors and other companies making sure that this closed system of, of drugs that starts with manufacturers, goes to drug distributors, and then goes to the pharmacy retail level uh, is maintained and that there are no leaks in this closed system. And so 
Joe had a story that he uh, that he was telling uh, Lenny that he was forced out of his job uh, because he was trying to and hold these companies accountable. And it sounded fantastic and, 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 and highly not plausible. And so my editor asked me if I would join up with Lenny and start investigating this. And so we did. And one of the first things that uh, I did is I sat down with Joe Benazizi for two hours and, and interviewed him. Um, and, and I quickly realized that he, he was a very credible source. I mean, I've, I've dealt with whistleblowers. When my, Scott I, came to me, I had, the Justice Department had just brought the first cases ever against Chinese nationals for selling fentanyl over the internet to Americans. And the Attorney General at that time, Jeff Sessions, was talking about fentanyl wherever he went. So Scott and I got together one day for lunch and decided we should really dig deep into fentanyl, figure out where did that all start? How is it coming into the country? And what was the responsibility of the government? What was the accountability uh, piece of the government? And we started out by first looking at the Obama administration, which was slow to deal with fentanyl. They, they didn't realize what a difficult problem this was. They saw it as sort of part of the prescription pill heroin crisis and didn't see that it was his own epidemic um, because it was coming into the country in a very unique way. It was coming through the mail, through the postal service from China and over the border in the Southwest border. So Scott and I set out doing a, set up a series of stories, uh, the fentanyl failure. We started out first on a story about the Obama administration and what they had done or hadn't done with regards to fentanyl. And then we turned to the Trump administration and wrote about their responsibilities, what they were doing. And to do this, we went out on the road. We went to New Hampshire, we went to Ohio, we were in New York um, and, we, and Baltimore and trying to see what was happening on the ground to tell this story. At the same time, the Washington Post filed a very important lawsuit in 2018. Uh, as Scott told you, he had found out about a database, a secret confidential DEA database called Arcos. Uh, it has a very boring bureaucratic name, automated reports and consolidated order system. We're just gonna call it Arcos. And that secret database basically followed the track of every single pill from manufacturer to distributor to pharmacy, and really is a roadmap for the opioid epidemic. And we wanted to get that. And so Scott had filed a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request that had been denied by the DEA. The Washington Post decides to file a lawsuit. And at that time, there's massive litigation going on uh, against these companies, against 24 companies. About 2,500 cities, towns, counties, Native American tribes had sued uh, these companies for their role in fueling the opioid epidemic. And all these lawsuits had been consolidated in Ohio, in Cleveland, Ohio, in something called the MDL, multi-district litigation. And as part of that litigation, the judge in that case had given the parties involved the Arcos database. And so the Washington Post's argument was, if they have this Arcos database, and this is a public court case, um, it, it, the judge had put this under seal so no one else could see it. So we argued in a lawsuit that the public should be able to, to get this information. So that lawsuit is going forward. But as a side note, let me just say, the Washington Post uh, went to try to find a lawyer to bring this lawsuit in Washington. They went to all the big law firms and all the big law firms in Washington were conflicted out. They couldn't do this because they were representing the drug companies involved in all this litigation. So we went to a lone practitioner in Ohio Karen Lefton, who took this case on. And we sued, and it went to Judge Polster in Cleveland, Ohio, who denied the request and said, no, we could not have this data. Uh, the Washington Post appealed, and this is important in our story to show you that it's a very important tool sometimes to, have to, to, to be able to sue uh, to get information. We appealed to the Sixth Circuit, also in Ohio. And that's going on at the same time as Scott and I are working on our fentanyl series. And I'm out there because Scott and I are trying to do a story about how fentanyl is coming into the country. And one of the ways is across the border, hidden in cars and on people. And I am out there and I get a phone call 
from Scott and from our editor saying, you have to drop everything and come home right now because the Sixth Circuit has ruled, overruled the judge, Judge Polster and said, we can have, we can get the Arcos database. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm here in 26 lanes of traffic with dogs that are sniffing drugs. And I'm, it took so long to get permission to get there from US Customs and Border. That the last thing I wanted to do was drop the story and come home. But our editor and Scott told me, you know, sometimes you just have to follow, you have to follow where the story goes. And so I left the border, flew back, and uh, we find out that in about two days or so, we're gonna get this, this data, this massive amount of data, and we try to get ready for it. And um, th there was, it was so large, the amount of information that was coming out of this DEA database that when it was put uh, online, there's something called PACER, which is the court system, when they put a, a motion up that the public can read, or when they put this database up, the, the PACER system kind of crashed. They couldn't even handle all the data. And the post had to get like a super duper computer to handle it because it was 370 million transactions that had to be run through our computer. And then once we got it, we had to figure out what does this mean? And so at that point, it had only been sort of Scott and I working on this. And the Post, this is what was so great about the Washington Post, is they assembled a team of people from all over the newsroom. The investigative team, the health staff, graphics people, video people, photographers, um, to come together as a team. And I'd never seen this at the Washington Post before. It was really quite astonishing to come together and look at this data and figure out what stories we can get out of it. And we're, I'm gonna leave a lot of what happened after that for questions from you all, but our first story was that we saw from, from the initial run of data that in a 12 year period, beginning in 2006, these drug companies, these manufacturers, distributors, and, and we, we'll talk about pharmacies later, but that they had flooded communities with 76 billion pain pills, which, to understand that number, in some communities, that was enough for uh, one pill per day for every man, woman, and child in the community. And when we got more data later on in our reporting, we got two more years of data, it grew to 100 billion pills. So the first thing we do is report these numbers. Then we overlaid that data. We have a, uh, someone we worked with who's an amazing wizard with numbers, a great data guy named Stephen Rich, who's part of this whole project. And he was able to overlay that with Centers for Disease Control data that showed that where most of these pills were going was where most of the deaths were. And that was very important for us to see right away. Um, and so those are sort of the main things that happened um, right away. And then we began a whole series of other stories uh, because along with unsealing those numbers, the court unsealed internal emails from the company that, that told us sort of what they knew when and internal documents that we were able to make into stories. So um, I probably talked too long. <laughs> um, I wanna open it up to all of you to ask questions to both of us. And as Scott said, we're writing a book about this right now and the litigation continues. There are 3000 uh, cities, towns, counties and tribes still suing the drug companies. So let me throw it out to you guys now. Wow, that's amazing. That's a lot of pills, sort of mind boggling. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie and Chris to conduct the questioning. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, Sari and Scott, for being with us today and for well, having a conversation I'm about- I'm professor, blah, blah, blah. Over the weekend, I had a family emergency. I left Thursday night, what? <laughs> um, Natalie, you're Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so again, thank you so much for being here and for having a conversation about your important reporting. And of course, congrats on your award. Um, Chris and I will be taking turns asking you both questions today. And the questions all came from the Journalism 1001 class. So students, if you're here part of that class, 
Thank you so much for your submissions. We are excited to ask those questions. Um, and the questions have been broken into a few categories. So we'll go ahead and start with questions regarding the content of your reporting. Um, and so the first question comes from Kevin B. And he asks, what was your knowledge of the opioid crisis going into your reporting? And do you believe this hurt or helped your investigation? And this can be for either of you. I think, Scott, are you talking? I think you're muted, Scott. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Sarah, can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Uh, so um, I had very little knowledge of the opioid epidemic, except for the, the fact that I had a couple of friends who lost their kids. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, obviously pretty heartbreaking. Um, and I had uh, a couple of family members who had some serious uh, drug problems. And so I, I was familiar enough to know that these are highly addictive and very dangerous drugs. And, uh, um, but I didn't know anything about the drug distribution network, the manufacturers. I, like everybody else, knew about Purdue Pharma. Um, because there, you know, very early on, there was some revelatory work done by other reporters, uh, particularly a guy named Barry Meyer at, at the New York Times, who uh, wound up writing a book called, called Pain Inc., um, which if you haven't read it, it's uh, kind of required reading, and it's all about uh, Purdue Pharma and how they changed the entire narrative about uh, pain in America, and that it was okay to take pain pills. Um, and so I, I, I think it always helps to come in uh, to a story without any preconceived notions. Uh, I mean, sometimes you, you can't help but have a, a background, whatever it is that you're covering, and sometimes that really helps. I think as an investigative reporter, um, we are constantly thrown into things um, where we have to become subject matter experts uh, fairly quickly. And I, I really enjoy that because I, I, I try to find um, who are the people in this universe who know um, more than anybody else about the subject. Um, and, 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 I, and I get to go to school all the time. I'm constantly, I feel like I'm in graduate school uh, with, with every story that, that we work on. Uh, and then this one's no different. And what you quickly learn is no matter what you're uh, reporting on or what you're investigating on, there's always a, a community, uh, a tightly knit community and they all speak to each other. Um, and if you can find that community and tap into it, you suddenly will get an incredible education about your subject matter. So in this case, it was the DEA. And I, and I had done a little bit of reporting about the DEA. I was at the Miami Herald kind of during the cocaine cowboy days. Um, so I had, uh, had uh, dealings with the DEA, but nothing like this. So I, 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 I really uh, got to know a lot of uh, um, uh, hardcore, long-time DEA people. And uh, there's a, a spree de corps within that agency that I really respected and, 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 and a lot of honorable men and women who had made a lot of sacrifices and, and really wanted me to understand uh, how they did their job, what, 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 the, what the regulations were, um, how they were being uh, skirted and violated by the companies. And so it was just a, it was a great uh, learning uh, process for me at first. And then I, and then when Sari came onto the project, I think that she probably found the same thing. Uh, she, Sari, and she'll tell you, has done a lot of work in the drug space, but nothing quite like this. Right, Sari? Right. I mean, I had reported a lot about drug crimes and drugs on the street, a lot about crack cocaine in the 1980s. Um, and I, I actually did a big project uh, a couple of years ago about when Obama was trying to kind of unwind the drug wars and um, give clemency to people who were in prison with very long sentences and because of the whole uh, issue of mass incarceration. So I was in it in that way I knew about drugs. And of course I knew a lot of people were dying from the opioid epidemic, but I knew nothing about what we have since learned. I thought there were just manufacturing companies. I didn't understand how 
there was this whole chain of distribution with the manufacturers, distributors, and chain pharmacies, and how they all were under obligation to obey and adhere to the Controlled Substances Act, which uh, basically controls what companies can do, regulates them with regard to dangerous, addictive, controlled substances. Great. Um, thanks again for joining us, Sari and Scott. I'm Chris. Um, so the next question is from Colleen J. And in the article, emails show indifference to drug crisis. It was claimed that Walgreens, the second highest distributor of opioids, never checked the validity of their orders to explain why they distribute such a high supply of opioids. Do you believe that there is a deeper issue behind the epidemic involving the most known pharmaceutical businesses, such as Walgreens? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, Walgreens, CVS, uh, Walmart, Rite Aid are all uh, being sued as part of this massive uh, litigation. Um, and so, you know, some of the most trusted names in America are being accused of uh, diverting uh, drugs to the black market and not paying attention to what was happening in their stores. You know, there's there's one story uh, that uh, that, and there's many of them, but there's there 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 is one that kind of sums up kind of the, what was happening uh, in the 2000s um, in in some of these uh, big chain pharmacies. They were making a lot of money uh, through the sale of opioids, um, and there were two stores in particular in Florida that a lot of uh, drug addicts and drug dealers, um, who all uh, again because they were in a community, all talked to each other, and they know where to go get their prescriptions filled. And a lot of these prescriptions were filled by corrupt doctors. They paid cash for these. These people did not have. Uh, any uh, um, problems that they needed opioids, uh, you know, for the surgeries or anything else, they were just getting illegal prescriptions from corrupt doctors, mostly in South Florida. And then they would go to this pharmacy. Uh, it was a CVS pharmacy in Sanford, Florida. And and in the parking lot every morning, it was it was like a it was like a rock concert. There were all these people waiting for the store to open up in these cars with out of state license plates. And all these sketchy people sleeping in their cars. Well, they obviously were on looking like drug addicts based on the, the surveillance the DEA was doing. And then the doors would open up. There'd be a line out the door, and all these people would come in with their prescriptions and get them filled. And so when the DEA finally uh, uh, intervened and and, uh, and and started questioning this this store, they went to the head pharmacist and said, you know, don't you understand what's happening here? And uh, and she said, well, well, yeah, but, you know, at, at two o'clock, we, we cut off all sales of opioids at two o'clock in the afternoon. And and this DEA investigator said, well, why do you do that? And she said, well, we want to save our pain medication for our real pain patients. And so that that in, in crystallized like what the, they knew in these pharmacies, they knew exactly what was happening. Um, but and they have a responsibility if they feel that there is a um, if there is a, a prescription that is fraudulent uh, or if somebody is coming in from an out of state with out of state license and they look like they're, they're high on drugs and they have they have a prescription that's written by somebody that's 300 miles away well that's suspicious and they're not supposed to fill that but they were filling those prescriptions all day long. And a lot of these pharmacies were doing that across the country. And if you look at the at the opioid files, as Sari was saying before, you can put in the, your hometown, your home county, uh, in our website. Um, it's public facing, and and you can see how many pills came into your community from which manufacturers, which distributors, and what was the number one pharmacy in, in your town. So we did that as a, as a as a way for. To, to hold these companies account accountable and for the public to see what exactly was happening behind the scenes of this epidemic. Yeah, and to kind of follow up to that question, um, Puneet S. asks, were you shocked when you learned that a big company like Walgreens contributed to the painkiller crisis? Uh, I don't know. I, I, maybe at, at this point in our careers, we're not shocked by a lot of things anymore. Uh, but you know, it, look, these are these are Fortune 
500, in some cases, Fortune 50 companies. Um, and so uh, it, it's, I, I think it's a little unsettling uh, to a lot of people who have lost their loved ones uh, to, to see now what has happened and, 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 and what these companies knew and when they knew it. Um, uh, it it's, and I've had a lot of people call me and a lot of people have called Sari and all the other members of our team uh, to say how, um, how devastating this information has been to them. Um, so, yeah, it's a little surprising that, that companies that are, are supposed to be protecting the public um, were, were, were not doing their jobs. So this question is from Micah C. Um, Sari, overprescription of painkillers by doctors is a clear contributor to this epidemic. To what degree is that a main factor in the crisis comparable to users who, be, who became um, abusers? users for chronic pain, and just plain old users? Overprescription by doctors is a huge factor in the story. Um, what Scott and I found is that in some cases, there were a lot of corrupt doctors. And he can tell you a little bit more about all these sort of fraudulent pain clinics that sprung up in South Florida and how people would drive um, from West Virginia and from Kentucky down the blue highway, they called it, because one of the pills was blue, um, manufactured actually, I think by Malincrot. And there were a lot of corrupt doctors making a ton of money, but you would go into the clinic, they would hardly even see you. you you'd say, I have some pain. They hardly even see you. You'd get a prescription and you'd walk into their, another room in the same office and get your drugs. So there were a lot of corrupt doctors, but there were also doctors who maybe have been well-meaning doctors, but, what we found and we wrote about was the intense marketing efforts by the companies to convince doctors, especially in the early 2000s, late 1990s and the early 2000s, that it was okay to uh, prescribe opioids. Up to that point, doctors had, had learned in medical school and believed that uh, pain pills were addictive. And these companies trained their sales forces and you can read it there's been a lot written about what purdue did it with regards to its sales forces but also johnson and johnson there was a big trial where a lot of this came out in oklahoma where they trained their sales forces to go and to talk to the doctors to take them to lunch to take them to dinner to take them to concerts and to talk to tell them that your patients um the chance of getting addicted is less than one percent and there's an incredible story that we've written about where this less than 1% came not from a study that was done, but by a letter that a doctor wrote in the New England G Journal of Medicine in the 1980s. It was like one paragraph, and it was something he was seeing in a hospital where a group of patients in a controlled environment in a hospital, a small percent were getting addicted. And that became the cornerstone of this less than 1% addiction argument to doctors. And doctors were taking the word of these uh, sales reps. Um, so doctors play a huge role in this. Um, and the next question comes, um, or falls under the category of how you went about reporting. And Juliana O oh asks, what do you have to consider when writing about people in a very fragile situation? Um, do you want me to start, Scott, and you can jump in on that? Okay. Um, you're muted, by the way, Scott. So. Uh, Juliana, um, so this is really uh, a challenge because when you're talking to people about addiction and specifically about their addiction, it's not like talking to a politician or to someone who's press savvy. Um, you, you have to help them understand that if they if their name is used, this is going to be in the paper and their their whole story will be out there. And if a person you're talking to is hesitant about having their whole story told about their efforts for rehab and then their relapses and terrible things they did when they were addicted, you have to be really sensitive to that and not pressure someone to tell their story just because you need color for your story. I mean, Scott and I have recently dealt with somebody like that where it's an incredible story and we want to tell it, 
but we also want this person to feel comfortable because his name will be in the paper. And although it's really important for people to understand what addicts go through and the problems with getting drug treatment and the problems of not of having relapses and then going through it again, you have to be sensitive to how be, having a newspaper story or being on television will change someone's life. And Scott, you wanna add anything to that? Um, you know, only that I, I think it's probably one of the most important skills that a reporter needs to have. Um, in addition to you know curiosity and a sense of outrage and um, and, and wanting to uh, hold people accountable, um, uh, corporations accountable, politicians accountable, but it's really you know trying to figure out how to connect with real people, just uh, everyday people, um, and that's something that only you, you can't be taught that in journalism school. You can't learn that from any book. It it's only, it only comes by by doing it and and by uh, you know, by being passionate about what we do, um, at, at, at all of us as, as reporters or, or uh, you know, budding young journalists, um, and also having a compassion for people um, and, and understanding um, what they're going through, uh, what might motivate them to talk, uh, what, what, what would be, a, you know, why, why their voices are so important. And, and and then also protecting people from themselves. I mean, there are some people who who want to tell us things and go on the record. And sometimes I feel like I need to protect them from themselves because some of the things that they might do would destroy their lives. Um, and because we've seen how this can play out sometimes. So it's it's a it's a tricky balancing act between informing the public, but also um, you know, being really uh, mindful and careful with, with sources. And I think that the more mindful and careful you are with sources, um, the more sources you'll, 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 you'll get in the course of your career because people can smell bullshit and people understand when you're a for serious person um, and you really want to tell their story and, and, and be uh, accurate about it and, and be fair about it. Um, and then people tend to talk to each other, and so you, you start to get a reputation, particularly if you stay in one place for a long time. So if you guys stay in Milwaukee, or if you go to you know, Miami, or Washington, or New York, and you work there for a certain period of time, you start to get a reputation as somebody who is a straight shooter, and somebody who uh, can be trusted. And so Sari and I feel like we've accomplished that to a certain degree. So it's a really important skill, I think, to have as a journalist. And I would just add to that, that you know, this kind of goes without saying, but it still needs to be said, that it's such an important thing to do as a reporter to listen, to just listen and to let there be silence. Sometimes in an interview, um, we there was a team of reporters and videographers who went to Southern Virginia shortly after this database came out to try to talk to real people and tell them what we had found out in terms of the number of pills and going into their community. And it, it's a really incredible video. I would highly recommend checking it out. It's on our, our website. But one of the things they talked to a man who was in law enforcement and he had seen this in real time in his community and he had tried to stop what was going on with the flooding of, into the community of oxycodone. And he realized after seeing these numbers, he hadn't done enough. And he started to talk about all the people he knew who were touched by this. And then he just stopped talking. Now, a lot of reporters may have just jumped in and started asking more questions, but the reporters and the person doing the video just let there be silence. And he just started breaking down in tears. Because sometimes when there's silence, you let people sit with their emotions and fe you know feel what they're talking to you about you know realizing what the, that these are people who have gone through very difficult situations so that's the only thing i'd add but it's just very important to just try hard to listen that's interesting i think the the importance of silence in an interview is a big thing that people often overlook and try to sort of fill the void so thank you for that 
piece of information. This question comes from Ava M. It's more about structure. So when you go about creating this uh, big piece of work, how do you attack narrative structure? Or do you even think about that? Do you think about a beginning, middle and end and how those elements impact the, the message you're trying to communicate? And this is for either of you. That's a great question. It's very topical because it's exactly what Sari and I are doing right now with our book. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's really important to always think in terms of narrative structure, whether you're writing a, uh, you know, a 500 word story or a, you know, 60,000 word book, uh, and because you need to know uh, where you're going all the time uh, as you're writing. So um, we're big fans of, uh, of putting together timelines. Um, whether it's a quick story on deadline or a story for the, you know, for that's an enterprise piece or for a longer investigative story to put together a timeline. And then to start looking at, uh, in that timeline, uh, pivot points, moments that are really important uh, and, and start thinking cinematically in terms of scenes uh, and what you need to build a scene so you can bring your reader into that story. Uh, and put them in that place and in that moment in time. And then the other thing that we always try to do is, is to look for themes. So when you have massive amounts of information, like we did with the opioid files, it was more information uh, than the Post had ever gotten uh, in the history of the news organization. Um, and uh, you know, Watergate, obviously, because that was just like paper, but more than the Snowden files, more than any other project. And so how do you divide up the stories? Well, you, you divide them up thematically. So we started looking at, at, at the themes that began to emerge. And so Sari had mentioned one of them, where, where were the highest concentration of pills and how did that correlate with the CDC mortality data? So that was one theme. You know, what kind of impact did this have on cities? So we looked at Philadelphia, we looked at Baltimore, what kind of an impact uh, did this have on, um, on small communities? What about the pharmacies? What about these drug distribution companies? So we did stories that focused just on the drug distribution companies. What about the manufacturers? Everybody knows about Purdue Pharma, but a lot of people have never heard of Mallinckrodt. How many people have ever heard of a company named Mallinckrodt? Well, they're the largest manufacturer in the United States of oxycodone, and you would never know it because nobody's ever heard of them and now they're filing for bankruptcy because of all of these lawsuits against them. So I think those are the, 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 the main things. We look for look at, at timelines, you look, look at scenes that you can build in your story, and you look for themes that can carry, uh, that you can organize your material around those themes. Definitely a lot to organize there, but... Um... This question comes from Natalia M. Is there anything that you would change regarding how the story came out and how the reporting was done? Sorry, how the story was. Oh, I don't. I don't think so. I, I, no, I mean, I. You know. You always want more time, believe it or not. We have we have a we have a luxury of time now because we're writing a book. But these stories, once the litigation started, it became very competitive. You know, we're competing with the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Reuters, Bloomberg, everybody. And so there's a lot of pressure to get these stories out quickly. And when you have the kind of data we had, but also all these internal emails and documents, and you're kind of rushing to quickly get the best ones up online into a store, into a, as, as you said, Chris, into a narrative structure. Um, you know, you always want more time, but um, this is just the reality of 24 seven news cycles that don't always. I think we had a great situation because we had such a huge team at the Washington Post and there's not much more we could have had, I think. Great. Yeah, that is, I'm glad you guys kind of sort of don't have any regrets, I guess. That's pretty, I'm glad you kind of went all in on everything and don't don't feel like you need to change anything. That's always uh, a good a good job well done. So this goes more into 
your career path, um, Sari specifically, how did it feel to be a woman in a field dominated by men, especially in the 80s? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, that's a really interesting question. I think I felt it most, not so much in the newsroom, not so much among uh, my peers, or I guess the, the field of journalism, but I um, came up in journalism in a, in a very uh, old traditional way of starting out by covering night police in a big city. So I was covering the police department and I was on the street covering crime. So I felt the police department was very male dominant. And I felt the challenge more there because here you are trying to get police officers, mostly men, to talk to you. And as a reporter, getting people to talk to you is always the art of persuasion and the art of seduction, in a sense, that because you're trying to say, hey, trust me, I'm a good person, tell me your story. So as a woman, I think there are challenges. It's sort of a fine line. You have to be very careful that you do it professionally and that there's if there's no indication that you're trying to be friends um, with the people you're covering. And so that's slightly tricky. Also, being a woman on the streets, the Washington Post in the 1980s gave us all bulletproof vests. Um, I was single at the time, and so I didn't have children to worry about. Uh, and so I would be out at all hours of night at night. And there were a couple of incidents. Um, one time my car was surrounded and someone pointed a gun at a photographer and me. One time bricks were thrown at us. I mean, things happen like that. Uh, I'm sure Scott has his story too. But I guess I felt it mostly covering the police department. And I tried just not to think about it and to sort of forge ahead. But that's a good question. It's a great question. And you know, and today, if you walk into our newsroom, well, you can't come into our newsroom now because it's shut down. But uh, it, you know, pre-COVID and after COVID, if you come into our newsroom, I think you'll be struck by how the business has completely changed. I mean, we have we have uh, we have tons of women in in positions of power. We just named another, another managing editor, a 36 year old woman, the youngest uh, managing editor in the Washington Post history, um, and so um, there there is much more diversity in our newsroom. There are way more uh, women in our newsroom in positions of power, not just re reporting power, but in, in, in key editing positions. So um, I, I think the, the Washington Post has done a, a, a good job, and they're trying to do an even better job of making the newsroom more reflective of the community that we cover and the country that we cover. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that there's been change in that moving forward there will hope to be more. Um, I have a question about kind of like the teamwork aspect of tackling this story. How did you guys in the Washington Post newsroom all work together to cover this large, important story while keeping the timeline in place and kind of keeping everyone on the same page? You know, one key is that we had amazing editors. Um, we have the, the investigative editor of the Washington Post, who I wish he was on this call with us because he's really incredible. Jacqueline, I would say he's the best investigative editor in the country. Um, he's been tied to so many Pulitzer Prizes and groundbreaking journalism. And he ran the team along with um, his deputy, Dave Fallis. And so they were managing this huge group of people. I think Scott and I could have not have been doing the writing and reporting and managing everybody. But they kind of kept the trains running on time and did an incredible job. That's what I would say. The key is having a fantastic editor. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it never would have happened without them because it was just, uh, it was like drinking out of the fire hose. And, uh, and, and so much information was coming at us. And, and, uh, and Jeff is, like Sari said, he's, a, he's kind of a, he's a, he's a genius. He's a master uh, 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 tactician. He's, he is great with strategy. He's great with figuring out reporters' strengths and weaknesses, putting together really great people on our team, um, and figuring out like who would do what. Division of labor is really important. And and I think in, in moments like like these, it's really important for everybody to put their egos aside. It's not about uh, who gets credit or who gets the first byline in a story. It, it, it's all hands on deck. 
Um, we all felt like it was kind of a moment in history and that and a lot of people wanted to be a part of it. And, uh, and we were really welcoming uh, to have as many really great people as we could to come on to, on to this project. And, you know, the Washington Post is, has a very deep bench. There's a lot of really, really great reporters there. And so it was just, it, you know, the work was grueling and it, it felt like we were back in college again. You know, it was a lot of sleepless nights and eating food out of the vending machines and stuff. And, uh, but it was, uh, it, was, it was real camaraderie. We were all in the trenches together working really hard. And, and supporting each other, uh, and so it was a uh, it was a great thing to be a part of, and and I think you guys probably have seen more and more, particularly in in these kind of trying uh, times journalistically and otherwise. Um, if you look at the New York Times or if you look at the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, you'll see a, a many many big stories with lots of different reporters' names on them. Uh, the, the days of like the lone wolf reporter. Um, just like going out by him or herself and coming back with these big stories or, or is kind of over. The, the, the news is move, moving so quickly. Things are happening so fast. And so it, it, we, we have to collaborate. If we don't collaborate, we'll, we'll, we'll never be able to you know, master all this information and be on top of it, um, be on top of the news and, 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 and ahead of the news. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great time to... To a to be a journalist and and it's a great time to to be a collaborative co-worker i think if you're if you're not collaborative in, in this day and age you're not going to survive and this is sort of uh, off point a bit but since scott talked about um collaboration one really cool thing that happened with this project and this had never uh we've never done anything quite like this before um this is collaboration outward to other journalists um so we created this database and um, we could not cover all the communities across the country that were being affected by the opioid epidemic. But what's really great is that 130 other media organizations use this database to write about their own communities, which they could do so much better than we could. And something like 44,000 some individual people were able to download the database and use it uh, to check on what was going on in their community. So it's a different kind of collaboration, but I like the Washington Post tried this model of letting other newspapers and television stations be part of the database. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned. Oh, go ahead. No, we, I mean, we, we took down our paywall also so that anybody can get access to this data because there are a lot of people who can't afford a subscription to the Washington Post. And we felt there were a lot of people in poor communities who needed access to this information. Um, and so Sari and I asked the top editors of the Washington Post to, uh, to consider removing the paywall so that uh, anybody could get access to this. And, and, and they did do that. Um, and then, you know, we have a great investigations editor. I think we'd be remiss not to mention that I think we have the best executive editor mm -hmm. in the business, by Marty Barron, who is, uh, he is, he is uh, I think he's going to go down in history as probably the best editor in American history. You know, there's Ben Bradley, obviously. There are these iconic people. Um, but, you know, Ben Bradley was just running a newspaper when he was running the Washington Post. And, and, uh, you know, Marty is not only running a newspaper, we're not, not really a newspaper anymore. You know, he's running the homepage and he's running the mobile app and he's running all the, you know, overseeing uh, everything that goes out on Twitter, all of our video journalists. And we, we, we used to have no video journalist department at all 10 years ago. And now we have like 100 video journalists. And so it's just a massive operation. And, and, and in the face of a president who continues to uh, call us fake news and uh, you know and fight us every step of the way, you know he has a very challenging job and and, and I think he's doing a remarkable job. So uh, and Marty was you know when Marty first heard about this project, he came to every meeting and he was like you know what do you guys need and he just cleared the decks. And at one point I think we had like 40, 50 people in the newsroom working on this this one project. Wow. I, excuse me, I just want to jump in and say that we have one minute left. I, 
uh, I think we could go on for a really long time, but I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So maybe some, some closing remarks. Well, I'm sorry we cut you off, Chris. I know you were trying to, I think you're about to say something. First of all, I, did you want to add something yeah, before we? Yeah, yeah, oh, no, no, you're fine. Go ahead with your uh, last remarks. <laughs> well, we don't have any prepared last remarks. We just thought you guys asked great questions. And it, it really, um, it gives me great sort of joy to see up and coming journalists who are so on it and ask all your, uh, your fellow um, students who ask good questions too. So thank you, Chris and Natalie, um, for that, for guiding the conversation so well. Thank you. <laughs> but thank you all. It was, it, it's really thank great. You. And, and, and it's an honor for us, truly. We, we, we love talking to, to, to the people who are going to be taking the baton from us <laughs> one day. So thank you. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, if we could give them a virtual round of applause, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much. We really we'll be in touch. It. Thank you.